Okay. Um, thank you very much, Professor Luhana. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, depending on where you're joining us from today. And thank you to all of you for joining in this webinar. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Hassan Idris. I have been in the energy industry for five years, and my association with IEEE is twice that long. Currently, I'm serving uh, IEEE in the capacity of the Region 10 Young Professional Representative for the Power and Energy Society. Uh, I'm grateful to the uh, Art and Humanitarian Technology Committee for giving us this amazing opportunity to present a webinar on improving energy access in rural areas, particularly those in developing countries. We'll be using um, a case study for an IEEE site project uh, along with today's webinar as a template to discuss site projects. So before we uh, move on, just want to make sure that uh, all of us can view the screen. Uh, Prakasha, please confirm if it's possible. Yeah, yes, it's fine. <clears throat> Great. So uh, to give you a brief outline, the webinar today, as it was mentioned by Professor Rohana, it's, uh, it's on improving uh, energy access in rural areas. And we're using a case study for the IEEE Special Interest Group on Humanitarian Technology, which is SITE. We'll be discussing that at length. I'm first going to provide an introduction as to what energy poverty in the developing world means and the impact that this has uh, on our world. Uh, this will be followed by a look at the challenges that currently impede our way to bringing energy home uh, to a billion plus people in the world and the opportunity that we can make use of to making this a reality. Um, we will go through the IEEE site energy access projects that have taken shape across the IEEE world and how they have done their bit in solving this challenge. Uh, finally, we will see the beginning to end story for the uh, empowering Umarkot project and that uh, how this project has been able to bring positive change um, in the community that we were working with. So uh, what exactly is energy poverty and uh, why is this so uh, important of a topic? Um, as you would know that supplying modern energy services uh, to the 1.2 billion people worldwide who are still cooking with traditional solid fuels and lacking access to electricity, this is probably one of the most uh, pressing problems facing humanity today. Um, the amount of energy which is needed to satisfy the uh, basic needs of rural populations around the world, it's relatively small, but the appropriate, appropriate technologies, uh, they are needed. Uh, widening this access to modern energy services, it's of course uh, limited by the extreme poverty, which is found particularly in the least developed countries. Um, in response to this kind of a scenario, uh, the then Secretary General of the United Nations Organization, uh, Ban Ki-moon, he launched a, uh, an initiative in 2011 that was called Sustainable Energy for All, SE for All. And this called on a number of institutions, including the governments, uh, businesses, and civil society organizations to make commitments to action to accomplish three objectives by 2030. Now, the first of these three objectives was ensuring universal access to modern energy services. Now, what that means is uh, making sure far, far reaching access to all by at least one source of energy was provided and was made possible. Uh, the second objective was doubling the global rate of uh, improvement in energy efficiency. Now, energy efficiency, uh, it's it means in making technological use to reduce the use of energy, like using LED bulbs instead of heat producing incandescent uh, light bulbs. Third objective was to uh, make sure that the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix was doubled. That means uh, making sure the ratio of energy sources like wind, uh, solar, and hydro 
in 2030 to the global energy input was double as what it was in 2011 by both uh, increasing renewable energy use and also by reducing the use of uh, fossil fuels that uh, emit greenhouse gases. Now, this initiative was it was caught on far and wide, so much so that the UN General Assembly uh, and their staff members and uh, their member states unanimously declared the decade that we are in presently from 2014 all the way to 2024 as the decade of sustainability, sustainable energy for all. This is one of the many uh, positive things which the last Secretary General did, and you can read all about that and the SE for all website as well. Now, the question is, uh, the question which arises, it's this, what can you do to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all? In the capacity of a, uh, maybe an IEEE volunteer, be it at whatever level, it is uh, your duty to think about this question. Now, from the 17 uh, UN sustainable, Sustainability Development Goals, which I'm sure um, you're aware of, the seventh goal forms our motivation to provide affordable and clean energy, which is mentioned here. Uh, the progress in rural electrification all over the world, it uses both centralized and grid-based approaches and small-scale decentralized technologies that can significantly improve uh, living standards in rural areas. The uh, technological developments alone, uh, they're, not, you know, they're, they're not sufficient to make sure that this is a reality and a lot of action has to be taken on the ground by not only the governments but also the individuals and other individuals and other organizations like IEEE. And now if you think about it, for the um, approximately 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, about 3 billion people, they have an unsafe, expensive, and fossil-based access. That's, that's a lot of people. And of this 3 billion people, up to 30% of their revenue on one year, done by a, a study by Schneider Electric, their revenue was spent on inefficient and dangerous forms of energy. Those forms of energy, uh, in short, which pollute the environment. Now that's a, uh, um, a heartbreaking statistic. I mean, not only do you have people who do not have access to energy, there is a lot. There's a large part of that population, apart from that, who are using um, energy sources which are unclean and which damage the environment. Now, the, this lack of adequate energy services in rural areas of developed countries especially, it has uh, social dimensions as well as serious environmental and health effects. Uh, many of these problems, they're uh, exacerbated by the uh, almost exclusive reliance of rural populations in most areas on traditional fuels like uh, biogas, like um, cow manure and you know other kinds of uh, locally sourced uh, material. What this does was that it is not only low on energy efficiency, it also releases uh, harmful emissions. And there should be a focus on technological opportunities as well as other strategies to make sure that adequate, affordable, cleaner energy supplies to rural areas, they're delivered. And that is the question which we are here to answer today and we are looking for different opportunities, different ways by we can make sure that this happens through uh, different avenues of IEEE volunteering, whether it is site, whether it is the Humanitarian Technology Initiative or you know whichever um, venture you are working in with IEEE. Um, you already know that the second half of the 20th century, it witnessed a uh, strong urbanization trend and the emergence of megacities, especially those in Asia, um, including China, India, uh, large parts of Far East Asia and um, South Asia as well. And those megacities contain more than 10 million people. Uh, you know, it, this kind of uh, trend grew in the second half of 20th century. Between uh, 1970 and 1990, uh, this share of people which, are, which were living in cities, it grew from 28 to 50%. Now, that's a huge, um, huge increase. All the while, the rural population relatively decreased during this period. The absolute number of people who were living in rural areas, it increased to 3 billion. Now, despite all of this growth, the rural development, it often remains low on government agendas. 
uh, primarily because of uh, increasing demands of growing uh, politically and economically dominant urban populations. Now in countries like China and India, like the large ones in Asia, a large part of population actually lives in rural areas, but they do not get as much attention or as much resources as larger cities do. Now, this explosive growth uh, of cities, it makes it very difficult for policymakers to give rural development uh, the attention it deserves. Moving on, uh, this is one slide which I was uh, moved by a lot. Um, I'm hoping that you can see that. This was a picture from Vox, Vox.com. It's a, a news and other kind of media outlet. Um, this picture shows um, how Delhi became the most polluted city on earth in uh, December, November 2017. Um, that news, that news outlet actually reported that breathing in the uh, in the city it actually was akin to smoking 50 cigarettes a day. And this is a huge, uh, huge uh, you know analogy which is uh, implicating a lot of things. Now, what happens in, in and around Delhi is that like there's a lot of crop burning activity that goes on. There's a lot of activity which is um, damaging the environment. Now, this is not primarily linked with just energy, but it is actually linked to the uh, damaging effects of uh, on the environment, which happens uh, because of our, um, of whether it is uh, nonchalance, whether it is uh, our need or whatever our wants are toward you know, some sort of energy source. So in that uh, in that period in 2017, November, the air quality, it reached epically bad proportions um, and was categorized as the worst or hazardous category. Um, you can see here, and uh, you would know from personal experience as well, that uh, energy has uh, innumerable benefits. Uh, and it creates social and economic development, and it creates a better life. Um, according to one of the many uh, programs which are run by Schneider Electric and other organizations, uh, their uh, aims and their um, goals when they're working in communities in which they want to provide improved energy access, it not only improves the, the usage or the efficiency of energy, it also impacts other areas uh, in which the society lives. This includes health, for example, and health, within health, it, they're able to provide safe lighting. Uh, there's a storage for medicine, like they can keep their uh, medicines in like things like refrigerators and cool them. They can improve their health services, uh, say by a consultant who can sit not only during day, but also thanks to lighting services during night as well. Economic development happens a lot. Um, the community can um, invest their time in agriculture. They can open up, um, they can, invest their own skills and in their skills and talents into other activities which can provide them with a uh, with some economic benefit as we will see in one of the projects in which we were going to read about today additionally um, security is also an area where where the impact of energy happens during uh, one of the projects in which we were working we saw that once we completed the project the community felt safer because during night time, they were having access to electricity. They were having access to energy and that provided them with a sense of um, relief. So that was because that community was in a rural area where they were having more um, incidents from wild animals and other kinds of insects. So that was something which provided them security with. <clears throat> Education is also one area which creates, uh, which has a positive impact thanks to the positive uh, effects of energy. There are improved working conditions reported at school and at home, thanks to better energy services. And another area is access to water. So with better, say for example, solar power pumps, you can have provision of drinking water and irrigation. So there's actually a lot of fallout um, benefits of energy and making sure that the improved access of energy happens in rural areas, this uh, creates a lot of snowball effect. Here um, I have uh, some details as, as to the access to energy program, which is run by Schneider Electric. Now, this is one of their private programs and we will see how 
different organizations are running these kind of programs in their own capacity. Um, the point of uh, deliberating some time on this is to see how effective and how sustainable energy programs are run. <clears throat> a lot of times, uh, different communities and different projects they're engaged in some kind of um, some kind of relationship, which leads to just one end. Now that's not just bad per se, but it would be much more beneficial if a little bit more time and energy is uh, invested in that project so that some sort of objectives are achieved, which are cross-functional, which are multifaceted. For example, uh, this program, uh, the Schneider Electric Organization, they offer some sort of business model with local community people, uh, which helps them design and de deploy adequate electrical distribution system. Uh, they provide some sort of uh, microfinance schemes, some sort of investments, <clears throat> which can, um, you know, provide these, the seed funding for innovative energy entrepreneurship uh, local programs. And finally, they also provide vocational training. So that can help the local people uh, deal with a lot of troubleshooting systems, deal with a lot of uh, hands-on uh, issues, which, which happen thanks to the, uh, Thanks to the uh, thanks to this program, actually, and this can help address local skill shortages. Uh, yes. So, what happens when we have um, a win-win scenario? Um, here, I'm just going to talk a bit about how you can enable effective and winning partnerships. Now, you can make sure that access to markets happen. So, a lot of times when uh, people are working in developed countries, they have issues with these two areas. They're not able to connect with the right organizations or they're not able to have access to, access to the right market. Um, I'm able, I, I was able to uh, separate this to like make a distinction between two kinds of uh, organizations which do this work across the world. Within the private sector, uh, you can see there are some organizations which are mentioned here, Philips or Signify, which it has been named recently. There's Little Sun, Schneider Electric, Euro Electric, GE, Acom. Now, this is not the only, uh, not, this is not, it's not like a comprehensive list here, but these organizations have a massive footprint, not only in the developed world, but also in the developing world, which includes um, large parts of Africa, which includes Latin America, which includes uh, Central America, which includes um, developing Asia, and you know, all those, those areas where you would not uh, generally ha have access to. Uh, on the other hand, um, humanitarian and development actors, uh, they're also working uh, globally, and their primary uh, focus area is not the developed world, but the developing world per se. So what happens is that uh, when you are able to cross these two, um, two areas, like not only the private sector actors, but also the humanitarian and development actors, uh, there is a lot of possibility where you can mix and match and make sure that you're able to reach the right community and you're able to make the right partnership. Uh, I've, I was able to find some organizations, again, this is not a comprehensive list on the right either. So there is MEI, which is the Moving Energy Initiative, e e EWB USA, which is Engineers Without Borders in the United States. Then there is uh, COOPI, which is the Cooperation International, it's a, a Latin American organization. There's FAO, which is the Food and Agriculture Organization, Practical Action, World Bank, and IFC programs. There's a World Food Program, uh, the GIZ is the German uh, Corp Corporation for International Cooperation. It's uh, spelled in Deutsch or German. And then there's, of course, the IEEE Foundation. So the point here is that um, once you are uh, embarking on a platform where you want to create a winning uh, relationship, uh, this is something you can work on and make sure that you're able to reach out to the right organizations. Now, there are lots of uh, challenges, of course, which exist on the ground. and these challenges can be converted into opportunities when you're working with uh, developing access to or improving access to energy in rural areas. Now, the first uh, problem or the first challenge, which occurs very frequently, is uh, is the fact that the margins are very low. So, if, for example, you have um, a business organization and you want to deploy, say, lighting uh, energy efficient lighting light bulbs in a uh, developing country or developing community. And you will see, of course, that the margins of profit are very low. That's primarily because of the fact that uh, the consumers there would not be able to either purchase them in large quantity or they would not be able to afford that. So you would not be going there with a high profit-making uh, market. 
secondly, the objective should be that, I mean, it should be kept in mind that the, the, the cost which uh, incurs initially, it's high and so is the risk. So when you're working in developing countries, there is a risk which is inherently, which inherently exists. Um, this could be related to security, this could be related to the political situation, this could be related to logistics, or even can be simple design uh, issues. So a lot of issues actually exist on the ground and they need to be uh, uh, really well in advance. Uh, one of the very interesting tools uh, available to IEEE site volunteers and you know basically everyone is the pestle analysis which is available online on their site toolkit and that includes the political environment, social, technological, legal and educational. Like there's lots of areas where you can uh, analyze each risk and assess it and make sure that you develop the mitigating techniques to solve those uh, or you know be, be able to tackle those challenges or risks head on. There's also an issue of lack of capital and you know you're not able to uh, source enough uh, investment to actually start that project. There is an issue with locating the right local partner and institutional commitment. Uh, many times the local partner is not able, you're not able to find one, you're not able to uh, have a trustworthy partner locally and then there can be a problem with uh, commit institutional commitment in the local uh, scenario. Um, one more uh, challenge which it can exist is that uh, without the traditional uh, distribution which happens in a regular developed economy, say for example, the cost can go really high for entrepreneurs to get supplies. Now, the supply chain is um, something which is which can get disturbed very easily because of the fact that you're not sure about each and every step. I mean, it, it is very routine to deliver, say, uh, you know, soaps or basic consumer good items to stores in the U.S. and in, in North America and in, in Europe, but it's not so much easy, say, in a uh, uh, a small community in West Africa. So those kind of issues are very con contrasting and should be um, looked upon in the, in the, at the onset of the project. In fact, before the project even started. There's also a need to balance uh, traditional aid with the most vulnerable and sustainable solutions. So that should be uh, taken care of. And uh, finally, uh, the cash disbursement programs, they open up an opportunity but they still need support. So there are like different options which uh, entrepreneurs can uh, look at, they can uh, find value in, but uh, basically the point which I'm trying to make here is that uh, every situation, every project needs to be looked upon with the best local scenario. There should be a lot of trust which needs to be earned and then the solution needs to be the right design fit for the community. Uh, now we'll just take a look at a few of the uh, site projects which have um, had which have had some sort of uh, acts some sort of uh, uh, focus on energy. Uh, this is one of the projects which was uh, done in El Salvador. It, it was a development of a photovoltaic solar system of 3.2 kilowatts. The community of a uh, Perkin in El Salvador it had a population of 400 inhabitants who were living in extreme poverty. Um, According to the uh, report, their survival was through tourism and the people uh, lived through by a means of sowing of tomatoes and cabbages. And this uh, sort of um, livelihood uh, mechanism was insufficient for the family uh, economy and, and that resulted in a lot of migration. It was legal or illegal to Central America, American countries or to the US as well. So there was this greenhouse which had machinery for conditioning the environment. And what the team, the site team, was able to do was make sure that they were uh, they worked with the local community, and they provided the electricity that required the uh, greenhouse machines to power, and that was able to that was something which enabled the local community to develop uh, an additional source of income, which was very uh, useful for the uh, people at hand. Uh, this site project was uh, in Bangladesh. It was a solar powered wheelchair. And the problem, problem that the um, site volunteers addressed was related to mobility of disabled people. Now, they saw, they, these, these uh, volunteers saw a problem, saw a challenge that the disabled people were bound to their wheelchairs and they had limited mobility access. So what they did was that they, their target was to build a system which would increase the moving distance 
of the wheelchair and this would be something by which they, they would actually be using a renewable energy source that would not only be environmentally friendly but also be cheap and finally the solution which they ended up developing was an electric wheelchair that uh, could charge the battery without the help of uh, access to grid and it was a low speed wheelchair that was uh, that could cover long distances uh, another project here which um, we're looking at is the site project in an Indian community. There were two phases in this project according to the uh, site volunteers. In the first phase, they were electrifying a remote village in Edu, uh, Edamulakal. I'm not sure where that was, probably uh, uh, somewhere where they can, uh, this, if the volunteers are joining us, they can tell us more about it. Uh, I'm not sure if the picture is of the same project. Uh, this was from the site blog. Uh, the second phase of uh, this site project was to assist the consumers to reduce their electricity consumption by using solar energy and by proper demand side management and distribution reconfiguration. So this was dated back December 2017. Not sure as to the status of the current status of this project, but it definitely was an interesting project, which not only had uh, a local energy use, but also had a far reaching distribution system operations uh, impact. Uh, now, yeah, which, what are exactly the steps which can lead you to a successful site project? Um, these steps which are, which are mentioned here, they're not like uh, set in stone. So you can go back, back and forth in some of them. And that is what um, encouraged when you're working in a, a human centered design solution. I mean, the idea is of course, to make sure that the solution is provided to the community, which is best, best fit for, for their needs but there is a certain way you're supposed to work uh, holistically. This uh, sort of a chain, it begins with the pre-assessment feasibility. Uh, what this means is that before they actually, before you actually begin a project, or before you actually start something, you need to make sure that your, your problem statement has some validity, it has some feasibility once it is fulfilled. So you're not only going to reverse engineer the solution, but you're also going to make sure that your solution is feasible uh, financially, technically, different ways. And this happens before you actually visit the site. So there's a lot of projects which can get shut down in the initial phase and that's fine. Uh, the next step, once you're able to uh, make sure that the solution is feasible is to survey. Now this survey happens once you're on the site. So you're able to see what's happening on the on the site, you see what kind of what sort of problems which people are facing and then you solve those problems. And this is followed by the design phase where you, where you get down to your drawing boards and make sure that you're developing some sort of the right solution, the right product, the right service to help alleviate that problem. <clears throat> now grant writing is not exactly a step if you're working in a uh, technologically, uh, technological entrepreneurship uh, area but it can be one if you're working on a site project. Uh, this is followed by engineering and installation. Uh, that means that once you've designed your uh, product or your service, you're, once, you have, once you have a commitment of funding, you're able to engineer and install the actual solution on the site, which leads you to the uh, handing over of the, of the solution and then regular operations and maintenance of the solution and then finally communication with the community. I mean, it's not like once the solution is deployed, everything ends. No, you make sure that communication is established, you make sure that whenever assistance is needed, you're able to provide that, and that is what ensures longevity of your solution. Um, now we're gonna go to that case study which I was talking about in the beginning of the uh, presentation. Uh, let's give you a brief uh, overview of what electrification scenario in Pakistan is like. So in Pakistan, uh, there's a population of about 200 million and of that 200 million, about 140 million people either have no access to power grid or suffer daily outages. Now, of course, the vast majority of this 140 million is uh, those people who are suffering outages because even in large cities, uh, outages are common. Um, these countrywide shortfalls can be as high as eight and a half gigawatt. Um, according to some reliable estimates, uh, chronic power shortage outages they cost the economy of the country about 14 billion rupees in 2015. And there is still a lot of areas without power. There are some villages in Southern part of the Punjab province. Uh, there are some uh, Northwest villages, uh, Northwest hilly areas in this part of the area of the country. 
and then the some eastern Sin uh, province where there are lots of communities without power, and then there are some southwest areas in Balochistan where they still don't have power. Um, so the project which we were focusing on uh, back when we started our IEEE site uh, work was in this community in Revi Jidhani, Omarkot, and this is located in the eastern part of Sindh, which is still not having access to reliable power, and that's where our solution was focused on. So Umarkot was the uh, district in which we worked. Uh, just some background information about this community, what what this means, uh, what they were having the like. Uh, this uh, this area is perennially drought drought ridden. So what what that means is that they don't have access to let alone energy. They don't have access to continuous water supply, which is even more uh, of a pressing problem for the people. Uh, in that entire area, that district, there are like about 700,000 people, according to the 2016 estimates. Um, of these people, uh, there are about 23,725 villages that existed. Now, a lot of these villages are small, just like the one which you worked in, it was a small village. But um, the problem which existed was that um, they neither had access to power or, electric or a water. Uh, the 50 percent of the people, like the 700,000 people, they lived with $1.90 a day, and that's a uh, poverty line according to some estimates, and uh, that's um, that's a huge uh, a, the huge part of the population which which lives uh, under poverty. The female literacy was 10%, uh, infant mortality was really high, and other statistics suggested that there's a lot of a diverse uh, community which lived, and they had some really choppy means of uh, means of uh, earning. Now, Reva Chidhani was the community where we worked in. This is one of the pictures where uh, we surveyed on the site. Uh, this was a small community with about 30 households. Um, around 200 people lived there at the time, and that was around 67 persons uh, in one house. Demographically, this was a very young community. A lot of potential for education and the right business ideas and models existed. Um, within this area, we saw that there was usually one breadwinner per household. Uh, who had to feed about 67 persons in, the, in that household. So the average income for one breadwinner was about 200 rupees a day, or about two dollars 83 cents a day. It was like not a lot. Uh, this community was in the midst of desert, right smack in the middle of the uh, Rajasthan desert in India, which crosses in India and Pakistan. Uh, there was little or no farming in this area, and men and women usually went to other villages for wheat or cotton picking. The areas where we worked in in this community, uh, it included, uh, it was an energy solution, of course. Uh, it included, apart from that, a rechargeable light fixtures for latrines or toilets. Uh, no lights existed uh, as of then, uh, and you know, going to the toilets for people at night it meant exposing themselves to the risk of snakes and scorpions and other kinds of wild uh, insects in the dark. It was not only a problem for men, not only a problem for women and children, but also a problem for men. Um, we also saw the environment through business as a uh, as a solution, and we also saw the livestock shepherding and poultry as a potential offshoot solution thanks to our energy solution. The challenges which we encountered during this uh, project it, were basically threefold. One was uh, issues with people. There was a lot of difficulty in getting local engagement, but this was solved when we were able to get in touch with the right with the right uh, community partner. It was a local a non-governmental organization which we work with and they had a lot of trust, very good trust with the local community. They spoke the same language, they were previously engaged with the community and that's how we were able to um, pass, bypass that uh, challenge. There were some political and societal roadblocks as well. We were able to sign, get a, a memorandum of understanding signed with the local union committee, union council representative and that was some initial uh, fr friction with the local community but that was solved when their uh, rep government representative was on board. Finally, there was some financial uh, challenge as well. Uh, we were unsure of long-term funding. We were unsure that we would get the right business model, and that was something which we thought was an issue in the beginning. Uh, I'll quickly take you through the design phase, what actually constituted that. There was a lot of survey results which we had to do. A lot of survey results had to be um, ex extrapolated correctly. There was a good amount of technical and commercial uh, analysis of feasibility which had to take place. Um, there was lots of drawings and designs and layouts which we had to do like going back and then of course design meetings where we discussed 
what we had right and not so much. Uh, this was followed by the installation phase. Just a few pictures here. We were able to engage well with the community. Uh, one good thing was that they were very, very friendly once uh, you had overcome that initial trust gap. And that is actually what happens in a lot of uh, areas where we actually get to work. Because if you're not able to make sure that you're able to gel in well with the community, it, uh, it leaves. Uh, if you're not able to gel in well with the community, it does not really help you with the with the project. Uh, just a few more pictures of the installation, what it looked like once we were working on. Uh, I think I have a video here as well. Let's see, uh, it's probably the next slide. So this is what it looked like once we were done with the community, once the project was installed. Uh, let me see if I can play this. So basically, that was just to give you an idea of the uh, of the community, what it looked like, and just to get give give you a feel of it. Um, once we were uh, through with the installation and commissioning and handing over handing it over to the local community, we wanted to make sure that they were in the best of hands. Like these uh, system, the system was not left to uh, you know to rot. Uh, so what we did was that we made a PV system maintenance guide in English. And that was also translated to Sindhi, which was the local language. Um, we gave that entire manual to the um, organization with which we were working with. And it had a maintenance schedule, like what needs to be done daily, weekly, monthly. It had maintenance log sheet for all of these durations. It had uh, system drawings. And then we wanted to make sure that people knew what they were doing. So this was one of the steps which uh, we believe uh, enabled our successful uh, and still is enabling its successful, uh, you know, run through. Uh, some other aspects of how we ensured this was that this was the uh, regular reporting, which the local community it's uh, termed as AWARE, which stands for the Association for Water uh, Applied uh, Applied Knowledge and Renewable Energy, and they work in different areas. And they make sure that they are able to send in uh, regular reports of the system as and when needed. Uh, one of the great things which they were able to do was uh, get the people into a community meeting. They had that initially, which was like an onboarding um, thing for the people in the beginning. Uh, this sheet here in the middle, it shows the, as you can see, it shows a lot of thumbprints, like thumb signatures right next to their names and uh, their designation as to what they represent, which community they represent. And this, this was like a, a contract for those people that now that this these, uh, PV systems were installed in their community. They were in charge of that, and they were able to devote money every month to like a community community uh, piggy bank, and that enabled its uh, regular operation and maintenance. This is one of the uh, maps. Was this one, which just helped people understand the location of their houses. Uh, this is just a story from the from the from the actual site. And I just named it side stories. Um, I'll just read it through it. A woman named Kasonbi belong, who belonged to this village, she shared, shared her view. She said that uh, after this project, I can stay at home alone in the evenings now. Earlier, I had to call somebody from the neighborhood to stay with me because of the fear from wild animals when my husband was not at home. And snake and insect bites were also common in the village. As such incidents are reduced, uh, children of our village, they spend significant portion of their time in household activities in daytime and did not previously have the large study at night, but now they do continue this study at night and late hours. 
uh, her husband Mehram said that before this, the youth should spend the money and time to charging phones from the nearby stations. But now the PV systems, uh, they help us charge and improve the communication and expenditure on lighting and charging has been reduced substantially. So this PV system also had outlets for like small uh, phone charging outlets and this was really helpful to the people. Uh, our way forward from that was charting up the sustainable scope of work. We wanted to make sure that uh, once we were uh, done with the installation and commissioning, it was not uh, left for, for, you know, for not left uh, in wilderness. So we wanted to make sure that it was sustainable, uh, which is why we engage local leadership and we also look at it potential funding partners so that they're able to sustain in once this, for example, they need more expensive batteries, for example, once they need some more money for troubleshooting, apart from the fact that they were, of course, contributing uh, their own money monthly. Um, I'm just going to end it in a slide here. So these are just a few of the sources which I used uh, to develop a lot of the initial part of the presentation content. Uh, you probably should check out these sources. They're really helpful information they have got. Uh, the Clean Energy Solution Center, the SE for All, which is a Sustainable Energy for All initiative, uh, Schneider Electric, the United Nations Development Program, and the United Nations Human uh, the Commission for Refugees, uh, IEEE Site and Smart Energy <laughs> Force, and the Engineers Without Borders USA. Uh, so just in conclusion, um, you know, what we believe is that the relationship between uh, energy services and the development uh, outcomes, it's, it's complex and it's influenced by many factors, uh, which are social, economic, environmental uh, conditions and the capacity at individual, uh, institutional, local and uh, national levels. Uh, I, we think at, that improved understanding about these factors, they can definitely shape the relationship between energy services and development outcomes that can significantly contribute to the design of better policy and programs. And with that, uh, I thank you very much. Uh, you can ask questions. We have, I think, about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Or if you're not able to get some time, you can email me a question or a comment or a suggestion. Um, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Asan. It's really nice, very comprehensive uh, uh, presentations uh, regarding uh, the project uh, we've done uh, uh, last year. Uh, any questions uh, for the from the participants uh, regarding the presentations? Uh, if if anybody have questions, they can write the questions. They can ask the question. I don't know. Uh, I don't see any questions here. But if you have any, uh, please do ask now. Yeah, probably. I I don't think. Is there any anybody have any questions regarding? Uh, I don't think. Uh, um, I think there is one question from John. He oh. says that which, yeah, he says that he's asking which area did you work on and what were the challenges? Uh, and by area, he means like geographic locations. So the geographic okay. location, um, as uh, was mentioned, was in the uh, southeastern part of the country in the Sindh province, and that part of the country. Uh, has a huge desert area which and this is it connects the border the eastern border of Pakistan with India and that's called the Rajasthan desert so that desert is um, has a really hot and humid uh, hot and dry weather sorry and this kind of uh, climate um, makes it difficult for people to have access to water so basically their issue was with water but of course the second issue was access to energy as well um, that was a geographic location. Uh, the challenges which we faced uh, were, of course, first of all, making sure that we were able to establish trust for the community. Uh, this is something I believe has to be, uh, which has to come first. Um, a lot of times, uh, people go, by people, by people, I mean, the IEEE volunteers, they have some hard set ideas as to how to fix a problem. Now, that's good um, to begin with, but that's not the way things can be done or things should be done because once you actually 
meet with the people you know, and you talk with them and see and learn and observe how they're how they're actually uh, leading their day to day lives. That's when you understand what kind of um, solution you need to develop to solve that problem. Uh, we initially, that is to say, uh, Prakash and myself, when we were working, and uh, we were thinking that a DC microgrid would be the best solution for them. But once we were able to visit the site, we saw that their homes were um, located in such a way that a microgrid would not be uh, a good idea because of the fact that there would be unnecessarily long um, wiring that would go on because their housing, as you saw in the video and that map and layout as well, was not built um, properly. It was a nomadic community and their houses were located at different distances from each other. So that made it difficult to design an electric system which had equal lengths of wiring done all, all across the uh, all across the community. So what we ended up so using the solution was uh, having uh, like PV home systems. And that was a better idea because each member of the household was the res responsible person for their for the solution as opposed to a common community uh, microgrid solution. So, so that so that's something I, I think was uh, were some of the biggest challenges for us. And um, those challenges could be different for different people once they're working in their own uh, or which, whichever communities they're working with. Thank you, John, for the question. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody have any other question? I don't think now the people. Uh, I have any question? So let's uh, conclude it. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you very much for your time, and really nicely you present this presentation. And uh, thank you all the participants uh, who have attended this uh, webinar. I hope you know you will uh, uh, joining us in our future webinars also. We have one more in this year probably in the last week of December. So thank you. I thank you all of uh, you and thank you Hassan Idris uh, for your time and presentations. So we'll uh, meet you some in the next uh, webinar. So till then I think uh, uh, we are getting off and uh, thank you very much. Thank you everyone.